All right, this is um, Logic Design. Uh, I think it's lecture maybe 22 or something. Uh, but this is for Friday, the uh, 16th of October. Amazing, we're halfway through the month, hard to believe. Um, anyway, uh, let's take a quick look at the syllabus and then we'll uh, finish up um, chapter 11 on flip-flops. So here's the syllabus. This is, uh, this is week eight. Again, that's pretty amazing, right? We were just cruising through the semester. And uh, so here we are Friday. Uh, there's a homework due on the 19th, so make sure you're working on that. Uh, and then we're going to finish up Unit 11. Uh, so read through that. Uh, take a look at that. And, uh, and then next week, we, we have uh, somewhat set it aside for, uh, for some... Uh, for some group projects uh, to be presented. So hopefully uh, your group is meeting and you're getting your group project done and you're uh, putting your presentations together. Now, uh, so uh, I, I guess I need to assign a date. I'm already thinking that it's unlikely that there are gonna be uh, two or three groups or maybe even four groups that would be ready to present on Monday. But if so, uh, that would be great. Send me a little email. And what what we'll do, I I I guess I'll schedule it. I guess I'll schedule it uh, for uh, right after office hours, or, or maybe maybe I'll schedule it for twelve thirty. Uh, so uh, so I'll do office hours from twelve to twelve thirty, and then at twelve thirty, uh, if there are any groups that want to present, feel free. And I'll I'll, uh, I'll send out a. Uh, I'll send out a general email, um, and hopefully uh, other students will log on and sort of watch your presentation. I don't know. Uh, so again, let me just review so it's really clear, and I'll send out an email to this effect. You have two options. You can uh, record a video of your presentation, which would include uh, going through your PowerPoints and, uh, uh, and then uh, the simulation. And you can upload that video to me, or you can. Uh, and and the best way to do that is just to create your own little Zoom uh, time, which is free. You can use Zoom for free. You're, you're restricted to 40 minutes length, uh, but you can set up a Zoom time, uh, record the Zoom session, and then you can upload the video. It's it's best if you upload it as an MP4. So if you do Zoom, try and save it as an MP4, and then uh, I think Zoom may do that automatically. Uh, and then just up, just email it to me. You need to make it no more than about 10 minutes or so, uh, <clears throat> and that'll keep the size small enough that you can email it. Um, and then I'll, I'll try and play some of those uh, during office hours if I get some. Or the other option is you can show up uh, at 12.30 on Monday, and uh, we'll also schedule a time for Wednesday and Friday next week, and you can actually present it live on Zoom. And that will also work too. Uh, that'll be a little harder, but, uh, but as long as each, each member of the group is logged on to Zoom, then you can, uh, and you can share your, your slides. Uh, uh, the person sharing the slides can continue to, to uh, click through the slides, and the next person talking uh, you know, can just kind of keep talking. Uh, and then you can uh, show the, uh, the simulation. You might have to change who's sharing their screen for the simulation part. That's fine. So those are the two things. Record a video of about 10 minutes length. Uh, it can be shorter. Try not to make it much longer. Or do a live uh, presentation on Zoom. Uh, and I'll probably set it up for Monday, uh, 1230, Wednesday, 1230, and Friday. 1230 something like that uh, and I think we have them set scheduled for next week and uh, yeah I guess that's it so we have one we have one week and then the following week week 10 so next week is week 9 the following week is 10 and on that Friday we have midterm test 2 which will cover chapters 5 6 7 8 9 10 and 11 and I'll do reviews that week and I'll probably also, uh, uh, yeah. And so I think I'll send out an email and basically 
I want all the projects uh, turned in by Friday, October 23rd, either presented at noon or turned in by uh, midnight uh, Friday night. I get maybe I'll even make it. I'll make it. I'll make it midnight Sunday night, uh, the 25th. So I'll send out an email to that effect. All right. Um, okay. So that having been said, let's uh, continue with uh, flip flops. Okay. So. Um, so we, we this is where we finished. We finished with the uh, with the JK, uh, and this is really uh, this is the master slave JK. This is really the the quintessential flip flop, and pretty much most modern flip flops are made out of a master slave JK, and then we can modify this to make a D, and that's pretty much what what most flip flops are. We do also use gated D latches. We do also use RS latches by themselves. Uh, because they're very they're faster, but they they have they have uh, some of the issues like R and S can't both be one and things like that. So so this is kind of the ideal flip flop. We get an edge triggered clock because we have this two stage effect where we set up the master stage and then when the clock uh, changes from uh, enabling these AND gates to enabling these AND gates and blocking these AND gates, then th this latch is frozen. It's in the hold mode, and its outputs drive the slave latch, which then uh, drives the outputs. And then those outputs are stable until we go through another cycle where the clock goes back uh, to where these are active and these aren't. But when it makes that transition, in this particular case, it, it happens on the low to high trans uh, sorry on the high to low transition. So it's a falling edge. When the edges when the edge rises in this particular flip flop. Uh, there's no transfer from the master to the slave stage. All, all that does is puts the slave stage in the hold mode and allows the master stage then to be updated to the next setting, whatever that might be. Might be the same outputs, might be different ones. But, um, but, but that change in the master stage during that part of the clock cycle won't be propagated through until the clock falls again. And so this is a very nice way to... Uh, to isolate changing the master stage from the slave stage uh, so that you don't inadvertently uh, change the outputs before you're ready, before that next falling clock edge. So that makes it a very stable, very predictable. Uh, and, and why do we use uh, edge clocks? We use edge clocks because th that edge gives you a very precise uh, time, uh, time mark. Uh, and if we have things changing within our system we have some some big system and things are all changing on that on that falling clock edge we know they're pretty well synchronized uh, <clears throat> and that uh, that that then gives us a, a a fairly high degree of confidence that we're not going to have uh, some things changing uh, you know one a few nanoseconds later and other things changing a few more nanoseconds later and other things a few more nanoseconds later we know that pretty much everything is going to be set up before that clock edge and on that clock edge it's going to change uh, if it's supposed to change and uh, flip-flops latch uh, registers which are really just a bank of flip-flops <clears throat> so so that's why we really like edge trigger clocks if your clock is a level clock like a gated D latch then as long as the gates open, any change in the inputs is still going to be reflected in the outputs. And that, that allows all sorts of uh, random changes to occur that can, be, uh, that can be problematic in a very large circuit. So we, we normally like our circuits really tightly controlled with these edge triggered clocks. All right. Um, so we do have characteristic equations for flip-flops. Uh, for the RS, it looks like this. And remember, there's the caveat on the RS characteristic equation that R anded with S is always equal to zero. In other words, they're never both one at the same time. The D characteristic equation is super simple. The next, and this Q plus, this Q plus is always read the next state of Q, which really means where Q, what Q becomes after the clock. Now, if there's no clock, then that's what Q becomes after uh, the signals change. Uh, 
But all these have clocks. Just the RS is one that typically does not have a clock. And uh, so the D, whatever D is, when the clock edge hits, Q plus is going to follow D. The JK, uh, this is the characteristic equation, but a much easier way to remember JK is J sets, K clears. So if J is 1 and K is 0, then Q plus is going to become a 1. If J is 0 and K is 1, Q plus is going to become a 0. If they're both 0, Q plus is going to hold at whatever Q was. And if they're both 1, then Q plus is going to be the opposite of Q. It's going to toggle. So <clears throat> we think of hold, set, clear, and toggle. Those are the four options with JK. 0, 0, uh, one, uh, zero 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And the T is very simple. If T is 1, it's going to toggle. If T is 0, it's going to hold. So if you think of it that way, these, you, it'll be easy for you to do the designs with flip-flops. You don't really have to memorize these characteristic equations, but you should look at them and see that you do understand uh, that, that if the present state of Q is 0, then JQ prime will be a 1, so that's going to set. If the present state of Q is 1, then K prime Q will be a 1, and that means... Uh, Yeah, that means the, the output will, um, yeah, I don't know if I said that right. Uh, let me state that again. So if, uh, if J is 1 and the current state of Q is 0, then it's going to set. If K is 0 and the current state of Q is 1, then it's going to stay 1. And otherwise, it'll flip. Okay, and then here we have uh, the T. Uh, so if T is one and Q is zero, then it's going to Q is going to go to Q plus will be one. If on the other hand uh, T is zero, then whatever Q is that will become Q plus. Hopefully that makes sense. So you should think through these. Uh, you know, just play with them a little bit. Put in some numbers and see what you get and, and try and understand. They're fairly simple equations, right? Just two terms each. All right. Now, uh, you can take a D flip-flop and turn it back into a JK by putting this uh, OR gate here, two AND gates going in and inverting K and doing this feedback like this. You can uh, implement a D with a JK by uh, putting D straight into J and inverting D into K. And you can convert a JK into a T by taking J and K and tying them together without an inverter, and that will be the T input. So if T is 1, then both J and K will be 1, and it'll toggle. If T is 0, both J and K will be 0, and it'll hold. All right, so there are some considerations for why we would choose different flip-flops. So uh, you will see that we this RS clock latch will typically use this when we have uh, a, a very uh, fast clock and we want to latch in quickly changing signals. This, this, this is the fastest latch we have. Uh, but you don't generally want to uh, use this in, in other uh, settings because of the concern about R and S both being one, uh, that you need to avoid that. Uh, it is, though, the fundamental building block for our flip-flops. The JK flip-flop is basically the most versatile. And, and also, most interestingly, when you uh, do a design with JKs, you usually wind up with the simplest, uh, uh, num the fewest number of gates. However, the downside is that you do require two inputs to the flip-flop. So if you're using a ROM to do the design, you'll have to have two columns for each flip-flop. Instead of if you're using Ds or Ts, for that matter, you would just have to have one column because these flip-flops only have one input. So it does make uh, some. It does add wiring 
and makes, if you're using ROMs, makes the ROMs bigger, but it usually does reduce the number of gates significantly. And we'll see that. We'll do some designs with different ones when we uh, start out in the, the next portion of the course and we look at uh, sequential design. The D uh, minimizes wires. It is pretty much what's used in most uh, very large scale integrated circuits. And uh, it's the easiest to design with because Q plus uh, it just equals D. Uh, and it's typically what we use for registers. Uh, most, most, of, most of our digital hardware uh, that involves flip-flops and registers, which almost all of it does, it uses D flip-flops. T's are kind of, sort of don't really exist. They're sort of mythical. You can't go out and buy a, uh, a T flip-flop per se, uh, but you can make one from a JK just by tying the two inputs together. And it's, it is maybe a, a reasonably good choice for counters, but for anything else, it's pr for sequential counters, but for anything else, it's not really that, that useful. Now, flip-flops can also have additional inputs, presets and clears. And these inputs can be uh, dependent on the clock or in most cases, uh, independent of the clock. And in that case, we call these, when they are dependent on the clock, we call them synchronous clears and presets or sets and clears, you can say that too, or you can say sets and resets. Uh, there's a bunch of different names, but a preset or a set just means we put the flip-flop in a, we force it to a one state, and a clear or a reset just means we, we force it to a zero state for the output Q. Of course, Q prime will always be the opposite of Q. <coughs> <coughs> it's nice to have these because this allows us to set up initial conditions and also do reset to do uh, have reset conditions that are fairly easy to implement. However, in our VLS, VLSI circuits where we make big chips, we don't necessarily want to include these, um, these presets and clears unless we're really going to use them. Um, and in most of our uh, FPGAs, we don't that include, and most of them do include flip-flops in every logic slice, maybe even several. Uh, we normally do not have both presets and clears available. We might have one but not the other. And also one other comment, the presets and clears can be active high and active low. And you'll, we'll talk more about this. All right, we've already uh, talked about the difference between combinational design and sequential design. And the big difference is we have memory in sequential design and the outputs depend on some history of previous inputs. Um, whereas in combinational logic, there's no feedback Outputs are simply a function of the current inputs and nothing else. And for instance, uh, our full adder circuit, that is a combinational circuit. Generally, we don't have a clock and generally, and it's not going to depend on previous histories. All right. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, I did want to talk about, we've talked about this sequential logic. Let's talk about synchronous systems and asynchronous systems. In most systems are synchronous, and there's a reference signal, normally we call it a clock, that causes the storage elements to accept new values and to change states all at the same time. There, you can make asynchronous systems where, uh, where there's not this common clock that syncs everything up, but those are much more difficult to deal with, certainly harder to debug, prone to uh, race conditions and other tricky things. Uh, so. I'd say most designers uh, avoid these things. Um, all right, so uh, the graphic control light is is one of the classic examples of a of a sequential uh, logic circuit, and uh, most of us have spent uh, a significant fraction of our life. Uh, watching traffic signals because we have to sit there and stare at them until they change. And we know they go through uh, a very number of discrete states. So if you want to know what the traffic light's going to do next, you have to know uh, the history. You have to know, well, what is it doing now? And, uh, and that will tell you, uh, that, that will enable you to predict the next state. And you, you see that the traffic light is a, is a classic uh, state machine. I'm not going to talk about it anymore. Uh, you probably get some exposure to it in the uh, lab portion of the course. All right, 
uh, let's just talk for a minute about this, about timing considerations. And uh, we've, I've mentioned this before. Here's a timing diagram for a D flip-flop. Here's the D, uh, in, the D input. Here's the clock input. And here's the Q output. There'd also be a Q prime output, which would be the inverse of Q. Now notice on the D, we have some timing considerations. And, and this is taken straight off the data sheet of a 74LS74. Uh, uh, it, it has two positive edge triggered D flip flops in it. And uh, <clears throat> uh, what, what it tells you, it tells you about setup time for your D input, hold time for your D input, minimum clock width, and what the propagation delays are for Q to transition from low to high and high to low. And a couple of things I'd like to point out. Uh, first off, there are requirements on your D input related to the clock. When the clock makes its transition and, and it must stay up for 25 nanoseconds. Now 25 nanoseconds is not very long. Um, so uh, a clock that had a period of 50 nanoseconds would be, uh, let, me, let me stop that and figure that out. Okay, so so 50 nanoseconds showing showing here. If I invert that, I get 20 megahertz. So so uh, so a clock running at uh, a clock with a period of 50 nanoseconds has a 20 uh, 20 megahertz clock. So so this flip flop can uh, respond uh, to a 20 megahertz clock signal. Uh, but if you if you make that clock signal smaller than that, then uh, then it's going to have trouble. Uh, if you speed it up to say uh, 50 megahertz, uh, this flip flop wouldn't be able to keep up. Now we definitely have flip flops that can. Uh, uh, so uh, our the FPGA we use in um, digital design uh, DSD uh, that board has a 100 megahertz clock driving the driving our FPGA. So all the flip-flops on that can respond. Uh, if you invert 100 megahertz, uh, I think you get one nanosec. Is that right? Uh, probably. Anyway, yeah, something like one nanosecond. So that's pretty cool. Uh, so there are uh, there are pretty fast. Well, let's see, 20 times five. Yeah, no, it'd be 10 nanoseconds. 10 nanosecond period would be 100 megahertz. A gigahertz would be one nanosecond. So, okay. Anyway, uh, you can see that there are constraints. So this particular part, the 74 LS 74, and this is this is a this is one of the faster ones, uh, but it's a discrete chip. So there's all sorts of considerations. Anyway, uh, these these uh, these take they they have a significant amount of uh, time that the clock has to stay up to latch everything in and. and and then before your output actually changes, it takes 25 nanoseconds for that. Uh, that's from low to high. From high to low, it could take as much as 40 nanoseconds. Now, why do we have two figures here? Well, the first is the maximum guaranteed. And then the next figure is the typical. So when they measure parts, they typically take 13 nanoseconds to go from low to high and 25 nanoseconds to go from high to low. But the company guarantees that you, that any part you buy will never be more than 25 uh, to go low to high or more than 40 to go high to low. And notice that the transition times from the rise time is not the same as the fall time. And these also, even though they don't say it here, but they will say it in the data sheet, uh, they do depend on uh, what the downstream logic is also. If you're driving a very, uh, 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 if you're driving a you know a whole bunch of gates with this output Q, uh, you might see this fall time greater. You might see the rise time longer, um, because it depends on things like parasitic capacitance uh, and the impedance of your downstream logic and other things. All right, we talked about the setup time, but notice there's also a data hold time. So if you if you take the data away without keeping it there for five, at least five nanoseconds after the, the clock gets halfway up to its maximum value, then you run the risk of this data not being latched in correctly. 
So you do have this 20 nanosecond hold time. So before the clock hits, the data has to be there and good for 20 nanoseconds. And it has to stay good for at least five nanoseconds after the clock hits. Okay. All right. Um, so the uh, so th this these are a couple of discrete parts. Again, you, you probably will not use discrete parts like this in your lifetime. Uh, they've pretty much gone the way of the dinosaurs. They're still out there. You can buy them, but they're they're not um, they're not common. All right. So 74, uh, 74, 74, It's a positive edge triggered flip flop with a D input and an output Q. Um, and here's the clock input. Now, if this were uh, the little carrot hat on here, means that it's edge triggered. And if you have no bubble, then that means it's positive edge triggered, it rising edge or positive edge. If there's a bubble, that means falling edge or negative edge. And uh, here we have a clock uh, and we have a D input and a Q output, but this is a level sensitive latch. Notice there's no carrot. So it's not edge triggered. So as long as the clock is high, any change in D will be propagated through to Q. So this is essentially a, we, you know, we'd call this a, a, a level, level sensitive uh, clock gated latch. All right. And you can see the 76, uh, if we have a change, if, as long as the clock is high, uh, this, change in, this change in D uh, does propagate through. But uh, in the 74, it doesn't because, uh, yeah, it, uh, it uh, well, in the 74, it does because the D was there before and after the clock edge. But uh, but here it doesn't because the clock edge hits, then D changes while the clock's high. In the 76, it propagates through, but in the 74, it doesn't because it's uh, it is not a level clock; it is an edge trigger clock. The edge hit here. The data wasn't available before the clock and for a little bit after, so it, it doesn't it doesn't latch that data in. Uh, almost all the flip flops you'll encounter will be the, the this edge triggered type. And this is the type we when we think of a flip flop, we normally think of this type of flip flop. We don't think of a of this level sensitive latch. But you, you can have a, a level sensitive and a lot of times we'll call this uh it we'll call this uh, a a gated D latch. All right. That pretty well covers then uh the the uh information on um On uh, on flip flops. Let me. Uh, I'm going to back this up. I do want to talk about the pro project presentations again. And let's see. Let me see if I can get this to respond. Well, apparently not. But now I can. Okay. So let me just go over this again. We talked about this uh, last week, or uh, Wednesday, uh, Wednesday. So, so I want you to get, uh, I want you to, to uh, do your problem. Remember, it's at the end of Unit Eight. I think everybody knows Eight Point A through Eight Point S. All those design problems. Your group has been assigned one based on your group number. Uh, something like ten to twelve minutes. Twelve minutes, maybe max. Uh, review your problem statement. You should put up a slide, a PowerPoint slide that explains your, what problem you had and what you have to do. You should also have one that lists all your group members and, and uh, whatever. Uh, then you should show your truth tables, explain you know how you kind of approach the problem, uh, show how you created KMAPs from your truth tables, and then how you solved them, uh, and then how you shared terms between your various outputs to minimize your final gate count so you could get down to your design goal. And then uh, then you should uh, list any lessons learned. You can do this at the end. but And then do a live demonstration uh, using Logisim uh, or Multisim. Uh, the book has a program that co <clears throat> comes with it called 
Simuaid, but it's really hard to use, so I, I would discourage you from that. Uh, <clears throat> and then, and then basically demo the demo the simulation and show that your solution actually does uh, uh, solve the problem. Um, if you want uh, later on, you can I will help you, and you can do an, an optional hardware implementation if you would like to do that, and uh, and that'll give you an extra course point. This project presentation will count for about 5% of your course grade. And then uh, uh, I, one of the things I want to know from each team is if everybody did, in fact, participate. Now, I know in this COVID world, it's a little hard. You can't get together so much. And uh, it, there may be difficult for some people. But, but as long as people participated at some level, maybe they made a few of the PowerPoint slides or did something, they were at least available. They interacted with the group and tried to help as best they could. We'll give them credit. But if somebody never responded to your emails or your text messages uh, and didn't do anything at all, let me know and they get a zero. So make sure if you're not participating that you uh, get off your butt and get involved in your group. Okay, uh, I think then that covers pretty much what I wanted to cover. Um, I think I'm just going to, I think I'll stop this recording at this point then. And, um, and we will... Um, uh, I will then uh, send out an email, but my plan is to uh, 12.30 Monday, 12.30 Wednesday, 12.30 Friday next week, allow any groups that want to do it live on Zoom to do it then. Uh, and then any groups that want to just make a video and send it to me, go ahead and do that. So uh, pick your poison. And we'll just stay on Zoom until everybody that wants to, to present has presented. So... All right.